Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming back to uh, this panel about the state of jazz in Australia. Um, we have done a few panels over the years uh, about various markets, and I'm happy to have uh, this group of people here with me today, the experts of Australia. Uh, the reason why we picked Australia was basically because the International Jazz Day will be held there this year, the, the big international concert. And we're going to talk about the impact of that at the end of the round of uh, information we want to give you about this market. Before we get started, I will very briefly introduce you the panel. Uh, to my right, it is Chelsea Wilson. She is the artistic director of the Stonington Jazz Festival and deputy chair of Music Victoria, if that's uh, correct. Uh, Jennifer Kerr, executive director, Melbourne International Jazz Festival. And uh, last but not least, Paul Grabowski, pianist extraordinaire, educator, and uh, one of the, the first persons whose music from Australia I really got into. So um, that's, there's a little bit of connection there. I actually started my trip to New York on Saturday with uh, going to hear James Morrison, just to be prepared for the panel in the right kind of groove. He was playing with Kurt Elling, and it was absolutely fantastic. Okay, we we'll talk a bit about Australia, which is the sixth biggest music market in the world, and basically facing the same problems like all the markets. Uh, physical sales are declining. Uh, the market is increasing thanks to subscription services and an increase in the subscription there. Um, jazz, in average, is about 1% of the total market. Um, it looks like this, the last year, uh, is going to be a little bit better. It might have to do with uh, certain releases, I don't know exactly. But by end of September, it was 4%, which is uh, high, but it's, you know, a sign we want to see it's good. People seem to be going out and buying music. Um, I would think we start where it all begins, um, and that is what is the situation in general of music education in Australia, and then specifically in uh, jazz education. And uh, I would ask Paul to start answering or giving us some information about that. Okay, thank you, Wolf, and good morning, everyone. Um, jazz education has been very important in Australia over the last 25 years. Um, when I started to play jazz, which was in the mid-1970s, there was really very little jazz education, and I think the first tertiary course opened at the Sydney Conservatorium under a very famous Australian jazz musician called Don Burroughs in around about 1977, 78, um, which... Uh, was a bit too late for me. Um, but after that, uh, between then and now, jazz education has completely taken off all over the country. And pretty much all of the major tertiary institutions which have music courses have jazz courses that they offer to postgraduate level. And that has meant that uh, a couple of generations of young people have gone through that, that system. And that, in turn, has meant that the music is thriving and uh, demonstrates a level of sophistication and diversity that uh, I think we can be justifiably quite proud of. Australia is a very unusual demographic identity because it's a nation of around 25 million people on a gigantically uh, diverse and complex island. It, some people call it the world's smallest continent or the world's largest island. It's somewhere in between those two things. And most of the population are coastal. So more than half of the population live in one of two cities, being Sydney or Melbourne. And then there are another number of other large-ish cities. Um, but that means that in the middle of the country, which is uh, to a great extent quite arid, it has a very small population density. So we have unusual things that we need to overcome in Australia in order to have a coherent kind of narrative. 
uh, which I think we're quite successful at achieving, but it's, it's very unique in a whole lot of ways. Um, so, you know, the education thing's been really important because what it has allowed is for uh, a kind of information flow to take place around the country. And whereas the jazz scenes, you know, 50 years ago were very isolated and had very little to do with each other, now they're quite integrated. And uh, right around the country we see musicians working with musicians from, you know, west coast, east coast or the north of the country down to the south. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, why it's been important. You want to add something? No, okay. Um, my question would be, when kids start going to school, do they still have kind of a general music education in the schools? Or is that, like in most European countries, not happening anymore and has been given over basically to private tutoring? Well, it depends what kind of school you go to, I think. Right. You know, we have two types of schooling. Essentially, there's state schools and then there's private schools. The private schools, of course, tend to be much more well-heeled. They've got more money for any number of reasons. And ironically, they are also subsidised by the state. Uh, the state school system tends to struggle a little more. Some state schools have got fantastic music programs. They tend to be specialised in that area, in fact. Um, but you're much more likely to get a general music education if you go to a private school in Australia than to a state school, Why? sadly. Yeah, and so unfortunately the same picture in many countries. Yeah. Both. Uh, primary and secondary school. So between five and 17 years of age. Yes, there are several. Yes, in Melbourne where we all live, there's the Victorian College of the Arts Secondary School, which is a kind of a, a, a training ground for young people who then go on to explore all of the performing and visual arts areas in higher education. Okay, and once the, the aspiring artist is finished with the education, uh, what opportunities are there? Is there a healthy club circuit where a young artist can go out and play? Um, there, you're running a festival that is based mainly on Australian local mm -hmm. artists, so there is some opportunities. Maybe you want to answer that question. Yeah, sure. Um, so as Wolf said, I'm the artistic director of the Stonington Jazz Festival. Um, I'm also a singer and a DJ and a jazz broadcaster. Um, and I'm currently the deputy chair of Music Victoria, which is the state peak body for contemporary music. Um, and at Music Victoria, we represent musicians as well as venues and music industry and advocate to government, um, you know, to kind of make sure that the health of the scene is really good. Um, and we've been able to bring about a few policies such as the agent of change policy, which is around soundproofing and protecting venues um, from being shut down due to property development and things like that. Um, in terms of the Melbourne live scene, it's really strong. Um, we have more live music venues in Melbourne per capita than Paris, London and so many other cities around the world. Um, there's all kinds of music going all the time from punk, metal, hip hop, dance, kind of whatever you want really. There's so many gigs going on, it's really overwhelming, a little bit like here actually. Um, and in terms of jazz, uh, we have I think six dedicated jazz clubs, um, but beyond those spaces there's jazz going on in, in all kinds of venues. Um, from cafes to small bars to Hammond organ nights to all kinds of stuff. We've got a really strong soul and funk scene as well. Um, big DJ culture. Um, Melbourne audiences really love music and they're quite a discerning crowd. So in a lot of our inner city venues, there's not like a lot of cover bands. It's mainly original and people are happy to pay a door charge to go and see music. So it's a really good environment for working musicians. It means it can be a bit competitive um, and hard to get gigs, um, but the audiences are really great. Um, and beyond that club scene, we've got some really big 
venues such as the Melbourne Recital Centre, which is really beautiful, our Arts Centre, um, and at Monash University, um, currently building the new Ian Potter Centre for Performing Arts. So there's all kinds of spaces for musicians to play in. And we've also got a really healthy jazz festival scene in Victoria. So as Wolf mentioned, um, I program the Stonington Jazz Festival, which showcases all Australian artists. Um, but one thing that I'm working on with the festival is to make it a showcase kind of event for um, international buyers and agents to come and, and watch new talent, um, to have an export focus. Um, and I'm sure Jen can, will talk more later about the Melbourne International Jazz Festival, which has um, incredible acts from all over the world coming to Melbourne to perform. And we also have the Wangaratta Jazz Festival, which is a regional event. So we've got a really strong scene in Melbourne for jazz. Um, and there is in the other cities around Australia too, but Melbourne is where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> um, running an international jazz festival in comparison to one that is focusing on local artists <coughs> is over the years the, the travel of the international artists to Austria, has that increased or is that on the same level as it's before? How, how do these things work? Because coming from wherever in the world to Australia is <coughs> not cheap, you know? No. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm the CEO of the Melbourne International Jazz Festival, which is Australia's uh, largest jazz festival. We program around 120 events over 10 days in early June each year and those 120 events will span from um, late night jam sessions to headline acts in um, our premier venues like Hamer Hall or the Arts Centre. So um, we run the full, the full spectrum of um, presentation styles, stylistic diversity, um, emerging and established artists. Uh, we have a very... Um, a very well-developed um, education um, partnership with Monash University, um, which sees us bring uh, international artists to Australia to work in depth with uh, music students. And Australia, um, one of the, the unique parts of Australia, we, we call it the, uh, the tyranny of distance. It's a long, long way on a plane. Um, but it's not but that bad. You can watch movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth it. It's a bit like New York. It's worth it when you get there. Um, and uh, for Australian musicians, you know, and I know I, I uh, originally trained as a classical musician, when you're growing up in Australia, you feel a long way from what are perceived to be um, the centres of excellence and the centres of innovation and um, new thinking and pedagogical thinking. And uh, so one of my personal missions at Jazz Festival, where I've been for nine years, the festival's been running, running for 22 years and I've been there for nearly nine years, um, was to uh, really strengthen that relate that opportunity for Australian artists um, emerging and, and student artists to get in a room with the people that they're sitting and watching on YouTube and listening to the recordings and picking apart every note. Um, and that's something I think we've done um, quite successfully. The artist the type of artists we've had over the years are oh, Terence Blanchard, um, Terry Lynn Carrington, um, Carla Blay. Um, that was a particular highlight for 82 years old, first time to Australia last year. Um, we should all be so lucky to be discovering new countries at 82, huh? Um, so the festival is... Um, uh, we do have the, the challenges in that we need to bring artists to Australia. There's often there, um, a, uh, an expectation or requirement from artists that if they're going to come all that way, they're going to pick up a, num a number, number of gigs in the... Um, in the region and that's probably the, the biggest challenge in programming a festival like ours is finding enough dates to put a tour together. We don't have the luxury of, you know, you come over here, you do a Western, you know, Western Coast tour, you can do, you know, seven or eight gigs in a week and a half. You go to Europe, you can do 30 day, 30 gigs in 30 days, you know, and not more than four hours travel between them. Um, Melbourne and Sydney are the two biggest cities and, uh, you know, they're 800 kilometres apart. Um, it's Quite, quite a distance. So we as a festival have overcome that by um, or addressed that by making sure that we are um, programming um, really great experiences for artists so that when they come to Australia they get really receptive audiences, 
Um, it's a big deal. You know, you feel you feel special when you come to our festival. We have a great volunteer corps who work with the artists who, um, you know, take them out to Hillsville Sanctuary to cuddle a koala and get the quintessential Australian experience. Um, we, and we, we force feed you Vegemite as well. We do. Yes, it's a rite of passage. Um, uh, the Bad Plus, by the way, do not like Vegemite. They were very, very <laughs> clear about that. Um, yeah, so that that's sort of a little, a little. So when you when you book these artists, do you directly work with other festivals to maybe find additional dates or with venues, or you leave that to a local agency? Uh, a bit of both. A bit of both. Um, yeah, uh, every every tour is a little bit different. I think we broker sort of between ten and twelve tours um, a year. We would like more programming partners. It would certainly make our life a lot easier, but. Um, there are a number of festivals, but none of us are on at the same time, which is spectacularly unhelpful. Um, but we do have a number of venues um, and other festivals. The Adelaide Cabaret Festival is on at the same time as us. Massive cabaret festival, funnily enough. Um, but we'll also pick up terrific vocalists like um, Cassandra Wilson, Diane Reeves. Um, so, you know, we have a very broad definition of what jazz is um, in our festival as well. So we'll do... Uh, the full gamut from, um, you know, Herbie Hancock to Ghost Note. Um, so we're not uh, limiting ourselves um, by only sticking to one particular type of genre. How many festivals are there in Australia for local artists like yours or for international artists or a combination? Jazz festivals or festivals? There's Jazz heaps. festivals. Jazz there's festivals, heaps. not so many. Not so many. Um, no, there's heaps. There's heaps of okay. little. <laughs> there's there's quite a few. There's a lot of small. There's a lot of country towns all around Australia that have jazz festivals, and we do have a long history of jazz in Australia. Um, you know, which Paul can probably talk more about more effectively than I can. Um, but we have the Australian Jazz Museum, and I was fortunate enough to um, curate an exhibition and work with the museum um, a couple of years ago. It was pretty wild. It's a bit of a sort of mess, to be honest. It's bit of an um, interesting experience at that museum. Um, but they have posters from tours from, you know, years ago and there's a massive um, lineage and you can see the real history of jazz in Australia and especially with trad jazz, which was... and the hot jazz stuff, which, you know, during wartime really picked up in Australia. We had a big... Um, a really strong big band scene... Um, so that sparked in all those kind of country towns all through Australia. There was there was big band and trad jazz and the Australian Jazz Convention, which is very trad. So, um, but you know, as Jen said, now um, there's all kinds of jazz going on in Australia, but there's definitely been historically a really strong trad jazz vibe. Mm. The the next question would be to the panel: um, You as a musician and you as festivals you need support from the media to, you know, build things and to, to get a brand going, whatever. Um, what's the situation for in, in, a, in a more kind of direct jazz media? Are there jazz magazines? Is there a good radio situation? Uh, television, we know in the most markets is difficult for our music. Wha what's the situation there and how helpful can it be for what uh, you as an artist and then you as a festivals are doing? So... Um there isn't uh, a jazz periodical. There, there has been various attempts to have one over the years, but at the moment there isn't an actual periodical. There's quite a lot of uh, activity online. There are blog sites which represent Australian jazz very effectively, I think, uh, generally run by very enthusiastic non-musicians. Um, the main radio outlet for the music is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, which um, is our ABC, which is like our version of the BBC. It's the national broadcaster. Very important uh, factor in Australian life generally. It's probably the largest media organisation in the country because it has a whole host of local radio stations, it has an inter a national TV network and it has a very strong online presence. They have a dedicated jazz station, 24 hours, seven days a week. So... ABC Jazz. It's called ABC Jazz. Creative title. It has the, uh, the second highest digital listenership in Australia. 
I'm not sure what the first is actually. They haven't told me, but mm. um, and they celebrate Probably racing <laughs> or sport. Yeah. Um, and they celebrate ten years this year in 2019. Yeah, so um, you know we are, I, th- I think, reasonably well served by media. I mean, jazz is a niche interest. I think that's safe to say about jazz anywhere in the world that it's generally speaking, enjoyed by a certain group of people. Um, and, you know, we hope always that that becomes general, uh, generationally reinvigorated, uh, which seems to be the case mm. in Australia, that young people gravitate to the music for reasons that um, I think change genera- generationally as well. I think the reasons why young people might discover jazz today are not necessarily the same reasons that my generation discovered it, because the scene obviously has moved on from how it was 50 years ago. But the media, you know, we always love to complain that we're not getting enough exposure, but I think considering the the size of the jazz audience, there's not a great deal to complain about, really. It's it's not that bad. There's a question Um, coming. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think we're all we're all actually quite keen to answer this question because it's a good one. Um, so, from the festival's point of view, we work very extensively with um, a number of media outlets. Um, in addition to the um, ABC Jazz uh, broadcaster, we're also I- incredibly fortunate in Melbourne. I'm probably still in Chelsea's thunder here um, to have a number of community radio stations, which are. Um, again, in Melbourne, sort of unlike any other community radio scene in the country, um, it's run by incredibly passionate, um, informed and knowledgeable volunteers who are out at gigs and playing gigs and then presenting gigs um, on on the radio all the time. Um, <clears throat> so we work very closely with, with those PBS. Um, we have also... We're very good at um, using... A, American acronyms in Australia. We've got the ABC, we've got PBS, um, which actually stands for, I think, Progressive Broadcasting it does. Mm-hmm. Um, organ, uh, Service. Um, we also work uh, with... We have a national publication, the Australian, and a number of state-based um, publications, uh, which are, like all print-based media, going through a period of... Um, Diminishment is probably the nicest way to, to phrase it. However, what is heartening that we, even within that we've seen arts coverage dropping from three pages to two to one, um, we will still get um, big dedicated articles, particularly for internationals and especially if they're doing multi-city dates. Um, so we work in partnership with um, other promoters to um, syndicate coverage and uh, we will... there's a dedicated jazz reviewer in Melbourne for The Age, which is our our state paper, and uh, also for The Australian. So um, it it might be... It's that that phrase, you know, she may be small, but she's fierce. Uh, That's our our media scene there. Um, So it's it's not extensive, but it's it's, uh, incredibly effective. Mm. Just to add to that on the radio tip, because I can't not talk about radio... (laughs) Um, in Australia, we have three different um, tiers of radio, the commercial radio, um, ABC, as Paul mentioned, our government-funded service, and then our independent radio scene. So the stations Jen was mentioning, PBS, Triple R, are our independent stations are, and are incredibly strong um, and have some really fantastic jazz programs. And when international acts come to town or when local acts have new records to put out or gigs to promote, um, the broadcasters are so keen to have them in. So um, at PBS, for example, I've interviewed artists like Gregory Porter and Jane Mon Hyatt, um, Kurt Elling. Um, we had Hiatus Coyote's first ever radio interview was on PBS. Um, we have a studio... Um, a recording and performance studio. So we have live performances with full backline and a piano in there for touring acts to come in um, and play a half an hour live set. And our listenership go to gigs. They hear tracks on the station and they buy tickets to those gigs and they go and see those artists. They're a really vibrant community. Um, There's over 300 independent stations um, dotted throughout Australia and there's jazz programs on most of those stations. So, um, as it seems to support... Okay, sorry. (laughs) 
Uh, again, it's, it's generally a case-by-case case basis. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards about specifics if you're interested. Cash. Cash. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the auditors hate cash. No, no. <laughs> we send people on tugboats, yeah. generally. <laughs> um, so, with a supportive media uh, for local and international artists and events, um, if I'm the young artist, I do my first gigs, I get the response from the media. My next step, obviously, is I want to make a record. Um, as far as I know, ABC has been and probably still is active in recording artists. Um, but what else is out there where young artists can go and get the support from an independent or other labels? Are the majors active? Um, Paul, how do you see that? Mm. Well, again, it's a bit of a checkered history. Um, the, the majors have not really been that heavily involved. I mean, they, they have a scant kind of appraisal of what jazz is. Uh, there are not many people working at the major labels who really understand the music, I would say. Uh, there have been a couple of exceptions, and I was fortunate uh, in the 1990s to benefit from a particular man called Phil Mortlock, who ran uh, Warner Music in Australia, and I signed to Warner yeah, in 1990 and did several albums for them, um, and another one which was released in the 2000s called Tales of Time and Space. So it, uh, I had a good relationship with them. With ABC, I've, I've had several releases on ABC Jazz. They're not doing as much recording as they used to, it has to, uh, has to be said. The ABC used to be very active in that space, but not so much these days. My latest release actually is a digital only. Uh, it's not a physical release at all, and that uh, came out through uh, a new label in London. Um, if you're interested, it's called Moons of Jupiter. I highly recommend it, of course. <laughs> which, which um, I believe premiered at the Melbourne Indeed, International it, Jazz Festival. Indeed, it premiered at the Melbourne International Jazz Festival. So much of my work does, Jennifer. Um, but, you know, uh, for young people these days, they're very self-motivating and they find ways of getting their music out which uh, are ob often ingenious ways. They really understand how to use social media uh, they often do their own labels. They make their own labels, um, and they're, you know, they're like small business people. Uh, it's, the music, in that sense, is a cottage industry. So uh, it's very, very safe to say that point of sale is uh, is the gig. You know, you're most more likely to, much more likely to, to sell uh, your CD at a concert. Um, particularly given the fact that a lot of specialist CD shops have closed in the last few years. So um, it's really about making CDs and getting out there and, and do, doing concerts and selling your merchandise at the concerts. Uh, that, that is really the way I think that more and more people are approaching it. And Chelsea's a recording artist too, so I'm, I'm sure she'll have uh, a, a more contemporary spin on it, right? Um, well, I think I 100% agree with Paul. The major labels... Um there's, there are, I mean, ABC Jazz um, has signed and released some kind of, you know, straight ahead stuff and some bits and pieces, um, but most of the Australian jazz acts are releasing independently. Um, Wolf mentioned um, physical sales declining, but Australia, like a lot of other parts of the world, have had a increase in vinyl sales. So a lot of our acts do quite well um, pressing records and we have a lot of record stores going very strong in Melbourne. CDs, not really. Um, a lot of the big kind of retail outlets, um, like your kind of Borders sort of vibe, not really. They're all sort of wrapped up. Um, department stores aren't really selling CDs and that kind of thing anymore either. But in terms of our um, vinyl records going very well and there's some really unreal stores. There's um, a site and a brochure called Dig in Melbourne. If you're a record collector, you'll have a very good time in Melbourne. Um, okay, now you made your record as the young artist we are talking about, um, self-released with uh, ABC uh, indie label. Um, the next question obviously is, um, how do I get out of Australia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
because I want to be a global star, obviously. So um, what can I do? And as you said, in your festival, it's kind of an expo, so you, you bring people in so that they can hear Australian talent. But what else is there that you can do? Is there a support system somewhere for that? Look, it's the big question, uh, and it is the burning issue for all Australian artists, I think, is, is our location. We are so far away from... We, I like to refer to Australia as the dark side of the moon because <laughs> it really is, you know, kind of... It, it's down there somewhere. Down under, in fact, which is, you know, the way we're seen. So it's a, always a challenge for Australian artists to develop uh, a career because... As I mentioned earlier, we have a peculiar demographic situation in Australia and um, it doesn't really support the notion of a full-time musician. Most jazz musicians that I know, in fact I'd say probably all of them, have to support their careers by doing other things, teaching, you know, uh, or other jobs altogether. So it's really important that we uh, find ways to link Australia to the rest of the world and there are now moves afoot to make that happen. Um, and I think that there's... I, I'm very optimistic about this. I think that increasingly we will see mechanisms for promoting our music overseas. Whenever I travel, I note that there is considerable interest in Australian jazz music. And, you know, wherever I go, whether it's Japan or the States or Europe, I find people who are quite knowledgeable about it have checked it out through various different pathways and you know once you get to know a bit about Australian jazz music you discover that it is very exciting um, but we need representation in these markets and I think that's the, the most important thing that we require uh, if you look at uh, a kind of a metaphor for the way I think of our jazz industry is our wine industry Australia is a major producer of high-end wine, also low-end wine, by the way. <laughs> We're very good at that too. Don't drink that yellow. And uh, we've done very well in this particular country selling some of our worst products. So uh, <laughs> thank you Sorry very much that. for that. Yeah. Thank you. We are, we are very grateful for your embrace <laughs> of it. Um, however... Uh, you know, our table wines have done incredibly well overseas and it's because the wine industry decided that they would make a collective push into various markets. They worked as a unity. They didn't go out as individual labels, they went as an industry and made sure that there were big trade events, um, that they were very aggressive in, in international marketplaces and it's worked. Mm. Uh, and China is the next big, you know, kind of target. I think, for, the, for that market. And, you know, East Asia for, uh, for jazz is also a growing market, so it's something that we have to be very aware of. But I think that the future for us in that regard is to work as a, as a kind of concerted, unified effort with a narrative. And I think the most important thing about Australian jazz in terms of selling it internationally is creating a narrative around it and then being able to talk to that narrative. I think also, if I may, um, <clears throat> in the meantime, the uh, festivals, particularly my festival, um, has a big role to play in showcasing uh, Australian talent to the international artists who we are bringing out to the festival. We're very big on uh, collaborations between Australian and international artists um, to both enhance the practice of uh, our artists and give them opportunities, but those artist-to-artist -artist connections, um, the importance of those cannot be underestimated. Um, we had a great example uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we had uh, um, Taylor McFerrin out performing in a gig who heard um, Hiatus Coyote, who were at the time just breaking, um, Nay Palm, the singer in that in particular, um, they've gone on to do creative projects together. She's on his album. Um, I think that was part of the groundswell of getting Hiatus into the US market. Um, and that was... Um, and there's no one single solution to breaking into a new market. It's a, it's a, a complex process. Um, and that is enhanced by the, the credibility of artists coming back and saying, I've heard this band in Australia and they're fantastic. Um, another great example is um, we have a terrific uh, sort of 
uh, Ethiopian band in Melbourne called Black Jesus Experience, who back in 2011 we put together with Mulatu Astarte, brought him out from Ethiopia for the first time, put them together. They've gone on to record, I think, four or five albums since. They've toured. Um, in fact, Mulatu is doing his last tour of Australia uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, there's sort of two examples of those um, uh, artist-to-artist connections that get fostered by festivals and that's a really critical part of what we do. And to a certain extent that's very organic. We can't um, – you can't make that happen. But what you can do is put all the players in a room together and wait for something to, to come out of it. So that's something we're very, very focused on. Um, I do think, like a lot of other territories around the world, um, musicians have had to – get more creative about how they build audiences and how they navigate through the industry, seeing that old school kind of model of having a manager and a label is, is kind of um, diminished. Um, in Australia, our kind of version of South by Southwest is called Big Sound. It happens in Brisbane. It's in September. Um, a lot of artists showcase at that event and do quite well. In Melbourne, we have a similar um, industry showcase event called Changes, Not neither of which are jazz specific, but um, definitely some future jazz and neo soul and kind of stuff like that we're, we're trying to infiltrate. Um, we've got some great examples of Australian artists that are doing really well, um, such as Hiatus Coyote that Jen mentioned, um, Alicia Joy and 3070, who are a really amazing future jazz band. Um, doing really well on BBC. Alicia just recorded with Giles Peterson um, when he was in Melbourne recently. And some other kind of acts like King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, um, who funnily enough have been, they're like a psychedelic rock kind of act, um, much to some of the jazz purists' um, absolute disdain, have been nominated for a jazz aria, which is our version of the Grammy, um, which I'd like to shout out now. Um, Paul Grabowski, if you're not familiar with his repertoire, has actually won six aria awards, I believe. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so you should... I had to pay big money for those two. <laughs> big money. <laughs> Uh, hopefully a vinyl release of, of some of the, some of those records. Um, and Courtney Barnett, she's not a jazz artist, but she's an Australian artist that's doing really well. So, yeah, we are far away, um, but there's some really exciting talent. There is uh, <coughs> there are a few more names which uh, I came across in my listening career, as I uh, mentioned before, besides uh, Paul and James Morrison, Mike Nock, very interesting player. Um, Dale Barlow, a fantastic uh, a musician. The Nex as a band that yeah. put the some Nex. some waves out. There was another kind of groove jazz band, uh, D.I.G. Dick, yep. which was quite yep. interesting and, and did some international uh, success and touring, especially in, in the UK. And nowadays, probably the one that is really up and coming is uh, Sarah McKenzie, yeah. uh, who is... Uh, uh, just working on a new record, which is uh, absolutely gorgeous, mm. and I think that will mm. help and should help the success of these artists to open doors as well for us, as I, I would assume. Yeah. We have a bit of a history of, you know, <coughs> uh, of having made small impacts on the, on the jazz scene. Uh, the Australian Jazz Quintet, I don't know if people are familiar with them, but they were a band that did very well in the United States in the 1950s. They were part of George Ween's touring circuit um, and did jazz at the Philharmonic and things like that as well, Norman Grants. But, um, yeah, they were quite a popular band at that time. Dale Barlow, who you just mentioned, was a jazz messenger. He, w he was with uh, Blakey for a couple of years in the early 90s. Um, and James Morrison, of course, many of you will know. James is probably our, our most famous jazz musician uh, of, of, our, of my generation, certainly. Um, so, yeah. And some incredible First Nations artists as well, um, such as the late Georgia Lee, who is the first um, Indigenous woman in Australia to record an album, which was a jazz blues kind of record. She toured with Nat King Cole. Um, and her niece, Wilma Redding, who is now based in Cairns and still alive, is an amazing vocalist. Um, and she toured with Duke Ellington and played with the Moscow Symphony Orchestra. And, um, yeah, so lots of different artists. It would actually um, be remiss of us, speaking of First Nations, uh, not to mention um, a particular project that Paul spearheaded uh, back in the ninth, late it's ninth. About thirteen years ago now. Yeah. Um, uh, like many countries, Australia is uh, finding a way to 
incorporate First Nations into our um, current and future civic discourse. And it's, a, um, it's uh, unfortunately a bit of a fraught integration, um, but music is one of the ways that we can demonstrate um, a shared collective future. Um, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd actually like Paul to, to talk a little bit about cr uh, Crossing Roper Bar, which was, um, I think, probably the first true bridge between contemporary improvisation in Australia and uh, First Nations musical practice, if that's fair to say. It is fair to say that. Um, look, it is important to say this too. Uh, we are the inheritors of the world's oldest performative traditions. Uh, the, the creative world of our Indigenous people stretches back at least 70,000 years uh, and it's still very much alive uh, and very dynamic. And uh, I think one of the great treasures that we have as Australians and what, something that really does give us a sense of uniqueness and pride is our First Nations heritage. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, just very briefly, Crossing Rover Bar, which you know you can discover online, uh, is a collaboration between the Australian Art Orchestra, which I founded in the early 1990s, and traditional uh, song makers from southeastern Arnhem Land, which is in the top of Australia, the top end, we call it, uh, from a very remote community called Nooka. And uh, these songs, uh, which we were very fortunate to be able to be given permission to work with, are of indeterminate age. They're ceremonial songs, um, but the musicians who perform them are incredible musicians and, and you know, the the complexity and sophistication of the First Nations music in Australia is something to check out. It's really extraordinary. Thanks. I think that was a very important point to make. Um, we asked before, what is happening and how can you go out? Now, I think some of the people here, the younger artists I see here, will ask the question the other way around. How do we get into Australia? <laughs> you know, how can we go and perform there? And uh, besides having festivals, their managers or they can approach themselves. What else is there? Are there agents that help? Or, or how does it work for international artists to get into the country? They have all come to you, Jennifer. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, <laughs> Again, uh, this is not spectacularly helpful. It, it's a little bit case by case. There's not so much a formal mechanism for doing so. Um, certainly from a festival perspective, uh, we work um, with a number of booking, agency, uh, booking agents uh, directly or artists directly if they don't have representation. Um, I don't know if any of you are involved in the process of festival programming. Um, I am indirectly involved, so um, uh, please take everything I say with a, a slight grain of salt. But um, to me, festival programming is uh, its a little bit um, uh, chicken entrails at full moon. There's no systematic way of programming a festival and where you start and where you end up are always two totally different things. Actually, Paul can probably elaborate because he actually does the program. Um, but uh, for us, it's you putting together a mix of uh, artists that you know will work in your market. So we're always interested in hearing about new projects, uh, new collaborations. Um, we love it when artists, either Australian or international, come to us with existing uh, musical relationships and say, um, you know, I've just recorded an album with, you know, this drummer and we're going to release it next year and we'd love to do the, the launch at the festival. They're the sort of things that, as a festival, um, uh, we want to be showcasing and give us a point of difference because... Um, uh, Melbourne in particular has this insatiable appetite for the new. You can't do what's been done before and, and the question is always, oh, such and such is coming, and unless they're like... We had Branford Marsalis Quartet um, at last year's festival which sold spectacularly well. You know, phenomenal lineup, amazing musicians. All you need to do is say Branford Marsalis Quartet. People are like, here, take my money, um, which is great. You know, that's the festival programmer's, uh, festival manager's dream. Um, and then you have, um, you know, other projects which 
uh, less have more of that quality of discovery about it because as a festival what we aim for is for people to say to us, I, I didn't know who that artist was but because you programmed it I trusted your curatorial choices mm -hmm. and I have now discovered an artist that I didn't know before. That for us is the, is the holy grail. You don't always get it right but um, it feels really good when you do. Um, so that's something that we've really worked on very carefully. So... Um, we don't have a preconceived notion of uh, everything that we want to program. We're always looking for the new as well. So we get contacted um, regularly and, you know, we welcome that contact for people. Um, but we are, you know, the caveat is we're a festival. We're under the same commercial pressures as anybody else. Um, and anything that we do program has to make sense artistically as well as financially. We would all love to have the unlimited budget for the, you know, the projects that just are going to transform people's lives and we'd love to program that in the full festival but that's the reality is that you can't but um uh yeah so i think the uh, to go to your question paul um if you are looking to pitch to a it's the same as pitching to any other festival it's interesting that there are so many panels focusing on that within this congress because clearly it's something that everybody's grappling with it all comes down to quality of relationships and quality of product and being able to articulate that in a re in a way that stands you out from the crowd. So if you come to me and say, oh, I've got a swing band from Canada. I'm like, yep, great, what do you do? What do you do that's different from any every other swing band that comes to us, you know, three times a day? Are you going to work with a guest artist? Have you got a new project coming out? Are you, um, you know, are you all performing upside down in a circus tent? You know, what's the... Um, uh, it's not necessarily a gimmick, but it's just something that will separate you from from the um, from the crowd. If I can just jump in, the education thing is quite important here. We we have a relationship, as Jen mentioned earlier, with uh, I, I work at Monash University with Chelsea. It's another one of her many roles in life as she works with us at uh, our Academy of Performing Arts. But um, we. L are very interested in artists who are prepared to come and work with our students. And there's a couple of different ways of doing that. I mean, you, we, either they come and just do a presentation to the students, do workshops, but we also create opportunities for the students to perform with visiting artists, uh, either in uh, a concert situation, which we call New Futures, which the, the um, festival have supported now for quite a few years, or through the mechanism of something called the Monash Art Ensemble, which is more of a high-end opportunity. Uh, and we've had some significant artists working with that ensemble. So Dave Douglas, Carla Bley, um, Tomasz Stanko, the late wonderful Polish trumpeter, uh, Django Bates, the British pianist and composer. I mean, these are all people who've come out and worked with that ensemble during uh, in the under the auspices of the Melbourne International Jazz Festival uh, and actually there's becoming it's starting to take shape now a circuit of educational institutions which can serve as a, another way another conduit for moving artists around the country so there'd be interest from the Sydney Conservatorium or from the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts both of them are very active in this area both of them uh, have very important, extraordinary jazz courses. Another one is at the Brisbane Conservatorium. So, you know, I can see that in the next few years that's going to become an, another method for moving visiting artists around Australia. And there's, there's other festivals as well, not just the jazz festivals. So, for example, um, Kamasi Washington last year played at Woe Adelaide. Um, acts like Snarky Poppy have just come, come over and, you know, sold 1,500 seats just putting on their own shows. Um, so there's, there's options beyond the, the, jazz, the jazz festivals, so all year round. Mm. Which uh, brings me to the final point of our um, info session here, um, because we are only 10 minutes away from mm. closing time. Um, International Jazz Day, the official big concert mm. happening in Australia in April. Um, what impact will that have? What does it mean for the Australian jazz scene that it is happening? Yeah. Well, the best answer I can give you to that is that that's an unknown. Um, it's a big thing. There's no doubt about that. It's a great opportunity. 
but I think there's still uh, a lot of uh, taking shape uh, happening at the moment. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, we can imagine that it's going to be um, important for us because <laughs> it, it, it's uh, a television uh, international broadcast opportunity and so therefore... Uh, if we get it right, it'll be an opportunity to showcase the what I've already been telling you about is a very diverse and exciting world of jazz. Um, and I know that James Morrison, who's really leading the charge on this, is very committed to making it uh, an inclusive and exciting showcase for our best artists. I think it's a case of watch this space. We're, we're very excited uh, to see it take shape. Okay, then I would uh, encourage questions. Uh, if you use the microphone, we can probably hear you all a little bit better. <laughs> Two short ones. Organizations, jazz organizations in Australia, and also what's the home concert scene like there? The which scene? Home concerts. Oh, like private like homes? Like sofa sounds and... Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, we have various organisations. We uh, they, they tend to be state or city-based. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the Jazz Co-op in Melbourne has been um, very active and very important in showcasing rising talent, new talent, for generations now. Um, and the Sydney Improvised Music Association, uh, again, very, very important and very active in the space. And actually, uh, they are doing some really exciting things now. There's been a new sort of infusion of new energy into the into SEMA, which I think is a, a really good thing to watch. So they're the two major ones that spring to mind. We don't really have a national body. Uh, there's been various attempts to do that over the years, but they haven't been spectacularly successful, driven as they often are by people who seem to have self-interest at heart rather than the interests of the scene collectively. Uh, I would like to think that that will change in my lifetime, but uh, let's see. Uh, house concerts, it's a small and new idea and it's mainly happening in the, more the singer-songwriter area. Country. Yeah. Mm. I know quite a few artists who do house concerts and, you know, I know it's quite a big thing in this country now and in Canada uh, and that there is this organisation which drives that uh, and I believe that there is a, a sense that... Well, actually, we've got an organisation in Australia which drives house concerts and I believe that they're starting to become active in the United States. So uh, it's happening but not so much yet in jazz. I mean, who wants to have jazz musicians in their home, really? <laughs> You'd have I to do. hide all the cutlery and everything. It's I just do. <laughs> um, in terms of other organisations, not jazz specific, but the Australia Council is our national arts um, and music funding body. Um, Creative Victoria is our state kind of funding body who support a lot of jazz. Um, I mentioned Music Victoria before, which I'm a board director of, is our state peak body for music um, in each state. Um, there's Music New South Wales, there's Q Music, and Q Music are the main deliverer of Big Sound, the conference I mentioned before. Um, also, the Australian Music Centre um, is a good one to check out. So, yeah, there's quite a few. Hi, my name is Dubi, and I'm the artistic director of the Red Sea Jazz Festival in Israel. And uh, I, I suffer of a lack of information about Australian jazz. I was in Melbourne Jazz Festival. I did the focus on Israeli jazz. I didn't listen the, to any Australian bands. I discovered Snarky Puppies there. I, <laughs> a lot of good bands, but not Australians. And I asked, don't you have... A, a festival just with Australians? I said, yes, but okay. But it was like, I think, one month after the Melbourne Jazz Festival. M month before. A month before, okay. Mm. And then where I discovered a jazz, wonderful jazz pianist when I did the focus on Israeli jazz in the Tokyo Jazz Festival. And this uh, guy, Paul, played there with his trio. And I approached him after the concert. I said, 
are you coming to Israel? I can't pay the flight. I said, no, okay, leave it to me. And they, <laughs> had, and they had a wonderful concert. But this is not the way really to... To, to do it. Yeah, Dobby, it's a great point and nice to see you again. Um, the uh, Australian Music Centre, which uh, Chelsea just mentioned, um, uh, I hope I'm allowed to talk about this, uh, there's a push for an international engagement strategy, a national international engagement strategy to address exactly that point because um, it has been very disparate um, to now up to individuals or particular organisations and in, there's a groundswell towards a unified approach to, um, uh, much like the wine industry, to uh, make it easier for international promoters and presenters to find out um, about what we've got going on. There, there are some examples in other markets you might want to look at, uh, whether it's... Uh, Jazz export from Norway or yeah. Mika in Austria. Mm. There, there are <laughs> institutions yeah. that are doing that already. So, so yeah, Norwegians are very good at it, actually. Very good at lots of things. Uh, um, yeah, so that's that's very much a, a watch this space over the next couple of years. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kate McGarry, and I'm a singer and educator, and. Um, I've been I've taught at Manhattan School of Music for a, a lot of years, and we saw, and I just want to comment, that we, we've seen uh, Australian singers coming that uh, really impressed me in terms of their, their ears and their ability to hear the changes. And mm. uh, I don't know, Joe Lowry, you guys are mm. familiar with, sure. um, and Gian Slater, mm. um, people who are, are come here and the vocalists <laughs> all go to see them because mm. they've got something really special. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask what's in the water there. Because <laughs> I really, I mean, Fluoride. I hear Australian, yeah. I mean, yes. Australian yeah. singers seem to really be able to hear, uh, hear the changes in a way and, and, and improvise in a way that's really fearless and just uh, really inspiring. Well, right? it's because yeah. they're very good musicians. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I, I think that they've, uh, there's been a generation of vocalists who've come up who are treated very seriously mm -hmm. for what they do. It's not just putting a person in front of a band in order to sing some songs. Mm -hmm. It's about coming up with a very integrated musical vision using a vocalist as part of an ensemble. And that happens a lot in our music. Mm -hmm. Also, there's, there's been some fantastic teachers. I mean, John, uh, John's teacher was a woman called Shelley Scown who I used to work a lot with. Shelley doesn't do a, a whole lot of live performing anymore. She's now a secondary school teacher, pretty much, working with Indigenous children. Wow. Um, but, you know, she was a f phenomenally gifted artist with an incredible ear and able to sing, I mean, uncannily, perfectly in tune uh, across a variety of almost unspeakably difficult music. Um, and she conveyed a lot of, you know, technical knowledge to people like John. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm. I studied at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music in Brisbane and there's some incredible vocalists that have um, come out of there, um, such as Kristen Barati, who won the Shaw International Vocal Competition years ago, who's just an incredible vocalist. Um, also Katie Noonan, Megan Washington, um, Kate miller Heidke, who's not really jazz, but she studied there as well. Ellie Hoyt, mm. um, Hannah Macklin. Um, there's a teacher there called, um, her name's Irene Bartlett, and she's amazing. There's a really strong pedagogy, vocal pedagogy program there. So all the vocal teachers, really serious ones, are kind of heading up there to do that program. That's wonderful. Mm. Thank you. Mm. I do want to just let you know that tonight uh, uh, I'm playing with Joe Lowry at a 55 bar in a, a band called Tea Party, so with our husbands. So uh, oh, come well down and hear us. Uh, oh, great. Thanks, Kate. Oh, okay. yeah. final, <laughs> final question, well please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'm, I'm David Schulman, um, improvising violinist and radio producer. And um, I just also I wanted to mostly say a thank you to Australia <laughs> in a couple of different contexts. One is um, the, the collaborative impulse that you described earlier. Um, was um, There was a, a band called Black Arm Band, which was working mm -hmm. with uh, uh, native peoples touring in this country. And uh, last year they did this tour where in each city they played, they would hire like local jazz musicians to, to be a key part of that band. And so that was mm. a great experience for me um, working out of Washington DC area um, to, to 
to play with these musicians, experience their music, and also be able to bring in a couple of the, the really top jazz uh, players like Janelle Gale, great jazz pianist in, in DC. Um, and the other, the other thing that, um, you know, I, I, I'm also a radio producer, and um, w about a year or so ago, it was ABC RN that mm -hmm. provided the home for a 30 minute uh, uh, documentary I did on the, um, really the, the greatest, to me, the greatest jazz violinist of the 20th century, Stuff Smith. Uh, in any case, the, the, the most important American jazz violinist of the 20th mm. century, and, uh, and less known today than he should be, mm -hmm. and he's so much fun. Mm. And, in, you know, um, we have jazz outlets in, 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 on the radio here, but things have evolved. You can't really do a 30-minute documentary. Mm. And so I feel like that whole piece about stuff and the rediscovery of his violin, which was, had been laying dormant for 50 years until... Um, until we, we found it again. Um, that found a home in Australia. So I feel like now people in Australia know, may know Stuff Smith's story better right. than many of us here in his home country. So um, and right. yeah, I just really appreciate <laughs> some of that zeitgeist. So Thank you. Radio National is one of the last bastions of that kind of in-depth um, exploration that you can do. It's very special. Um, to plays a very special part in a lot of people's lives. It's yeah. good, to, good to hear that, it's really great. Okay, final, final question, then we have to round up, come on. From New Zealand, no less. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering, and you guys, pro I mean, there might, there might be similar questions or philosophical questions asked in my New Zealand scene, but when I think of, like, loosely speaking, European jazz, there's a, there's a sort of an aesthetic that comes to mind. When I think of sort of New York trad Lincoln Center style jazz, there's an aesthetic. When I think of like revive hip hop slash jazz kind of combination, there's an aesthetic there. Do you feel like there's, in Australia, there's like a specific sonic aesthetic which makes the artists sound Australian, is there is there I'm, even a question that they ask themselves? I'm bowing out of this a, response, is, by is, the way, Mail Am. Sure. <laughs> uh, is, is that a question that they ask themselves? Is that something that's even worth consciously considering? Look, uh, it's a, of course, it's a great question. Um, uh, I think it's an impossible one to really answer because of the size and diversity of Australia. But if there's one group that, for me, conjures up something essentially Australian, it would be the Necks, uh, because they work with space, and they work across a space and time, like a spatial and temporal concept, which really does suggest something about duration. And I think duration is a really central idea to the Australian experience. Australia is very, very old, has been settled by human beings for a very long time, uh, and this sense of space and time, which our Indigenous people refer to as song lines, but that's a kind of a slightly misleading term because really what we're talking about is a kind of a way of conceptualising all time and space as being one unity. Uh, that's a difficult thing to sort of really translate directly into experience. I think that Australians, if, if there's something about our music which sets us apart, it's about the Australian essential ability to improvise because we've had to be good improvisers to create a nation in that place. And for people to have survived there as successfully as the Aboriginal people did for such a long time, they were brilliant improvisers. So it's more about the nature of the music itself which expresses the Australian character than characteristics of the music, if, if that makes sense. I think uh, with this uh, profound statement, <laughs> we're going to uh, close today's session. I hope that everybody in the room has a bit of a better understanding about the uh, jazz scene in Australia, about uh, you know, the positives and the challenges. And uh, we are all around, so if you have further questions, you can uh, throughout the day, I guess, talk to mainly
the panel, less me, I'm not Australian. <laughs> I'm trying to understand the music scene and uh, I have a bit of a history, but um, I thought it was extremely interesting. Uh, learned a little bit myself today here. I would like to thank the panel again. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Wolf.